it's it's so very hard to navigate everything. Um, I asked our earlier guests about being black in Canada. And I say that because we often hear that things are better in Canada, that all of the bad stuff happens in the United States. And if there is racism that rears its head, it's almost racism light. Um, but we are in industries where we are navigating predominantly white spaces, and that adds another layer. Uh, so, Brandon, I, I want you to weigh in on this. Uh, being Black in Canada, uh, racism in Canada. Want to get your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Marcy, I've had the fortunate ability to grow up in Southern Ontario in the GTA in the Greater Toronto Area, but also I started my career out west in northern BC, and I've also had the opportunity to live in the prairies in Saskatchewan. Um, so I've really tried to get a, a depth of, of the situation across this country through my profession. And generally, Canadians are good-hearted people. We should put that out there. That is, that is a matter of fact. But the situation that I found through my reporting and through my own personal experiences is that in Canada, a lot of times the racism might not be right in your face, but it's institutionalized within our institutions. For example, I look at the schooling system, the education system, and there have been numerous reports and numerous um, uh, dive-ins into the fact that when you look at suspension rates and expulsion rates, um, when you finally start to collect race-based data, which a lot of times within our institutions here in Canada, that is not the case. And when you do, when you do not collect race-based data and you do not have that evidence that you can point to, it's easy to say that this situation is not happening here. But once you actually get an organization, and a lot of activists have been doing this for quite some time, trying to push organizations to collect that race-based data so they can have that, um, uh, that evidence to point to, then you actually start to see what's taking place across our country. And when you look at different institutions like the education system, and you look at that Indigenous and Black and Brown uh, students are, are more likely to be uh, uh, suspended or, or expelled from school uh, compared to the white counterparts, then you start to see hard evidence right there. When you look at the healthcare system, right now we're uh, in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. In the states, their healthcare uh, 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 authorities across different states, they track race-based data. And it's very clear to see which segment of the population is uh, is experiencing um, COVID-19 at a different rate than others. Black people are dying more than white people. Here in Canada, our provincial health authorities, many of them do not collect race-based data. So you can't even say that this, if you want to say, which many activists are trying to say that, listen, uh, people of color, um, they're disproportionately being affected by COVID-19. A lot of times on the other end of the spectrum, provincial leaders or ministers will say, well, there's no data to prove that. Well, again, there's no data to prove that because we do not collect race-based data. When it comes to policing, another system in this country, um, especially CARDI, this was a big situation that happened over the past couple of years, and many activists who, who fought long and hard to, to get police forces to collect that race-based data. So the proof in the numbers could show after many black and brown people said and indigenous people said, listen, we feel that we're being unfairly targeted. We feel like we're constantly being carded. And many times when that when that uh, um, allegation or accusation was put forth to police forces, there was on the other side, there was, well, we don't believe that is happening. Well, you don't believe that's not happening because the numbers are not there because we do not collect race-based data. But once that started to begin, then the numbers were right there in our faces. And here's the situation when that happens. When you have the numbers right in your face, you are now confronted with two decisions. Do you say, well, that's what it is, and you let it go, and you move on with your everyday life, and those people who are suffering continue to suffer? Or the more challenging decision is, do we fix this? And now the big question is, how do we fix this? And that is a, that's a conundrum that huge a lot of question. people don't want to face because it's a complicated, it's a big, it's a huge, it, to find that solution requires a lot of work. And some people don't have the ability or just don't want to do that. Quite often. Brandon, I so appreciate everything you said. I, yes, go ahead, Larry. No, I was just going to add to what um, Brandon was saying is that quite oftentimes it's just a matter of, you know, um, proper human decency. And understanding that we're, we're we're all human beings, and that it's not a matter of 
superiority and inferiority. It's we, we're all human beings, and once we get rid of that belief that one culture is inferior to another, we could we can really fix things. But you just have to get rid of that mindset, and it's about education, it's about teaching, and it starts from the top. We're trying to do this from the bottom up. Then- it needs to start from the top down and anybody who understands corporate structure understands that society is built on corporate structure so things need to start from the top the people who make the decisions and instruct orders below them need to have the right headspace the right mentality and then they have to enforce that in mentality with those people and make sure that it's seen through and that there are actual consequences for their actions.